And a very warm welcome to a conversation about Western Balkans, old problems, new challenges, and great powers competition. My name is Doro Costa. I, am, uh, I have the privilege of being your host for the next 75 minutes or so. I left the Ministry of Foreign Affairs not so long ago, after 20, more than 27 years of working in one of the most ancient, noble, and sometimes rewarding professions that exists, that is diplomacy. But now, in order to very briefly introduce our topic, let me quote something to you. The Balkans must be considered both in terms of their own internal tensions and developments and in the wider European context, which includes growing nationalisms, revolutionary ideologies, and imperial rivalries." Unquote. Now, this is what Mrs. Margaret Macmillan, a Canadian well-known historian and expert in the history of the early 20th century, wrote in an essay in 2016. I think that this remark may, is quite relevant to the title of our debate, and it may also be a kind of guide for our discussion. Uh, I apologize. I deliberately misquoted Mrs. Macmillan because the full quotation should have been the Balkans before 1914. However, these remarks do cover the three main dimensions of the debate today. More than 100 years after La Grande Guerre came to an end and the subsequent peace ushered in a totally different reality. Three dimensions, development within the area, how the European and transatlantic organizations deal with the area, and what forms the great powers' interests take and to what consequences. These remarks I quoted from Mrs. Macmillan are true even as the background of our debate has been molded during the last eight months or so, give or take a couple of days, by something that is not a war. Indeed, the new pandemic that hit the world also boasted the reckoning of lingering, unsolved problems, while simultaneously heralding new ones. This dual effect of the pandemic was quite clear in the Zagreb Declaration on the 6th of May this year, at the end of the EU Western Balkans Summit. Likewise, it underpinned the 12.6 billion euros envelope of pre-accession assistance for the countries in the area in the next seven years, pending the approval of the European Parliament. But we are all aware, of course, that neither EU intentions nor the accession to NATO states belonging to the region happen in a bubble that would insulate the region from global trends. And the pandemic is just one piece of evidence to this truth. Moreover, those trends are not only all of them unfavorable, no necessarily indifferent to the basic values and principles of the Euro-Atlantic community. Now, to talk about all these things and other related issues, we take advantage of the first-hand knowledge, expertise, and wisdom of a special group of people who actually lived in the Western Balkans or have been dealing with the area for significant periods of their professional life. Very briefly, our guests are His Excellency, Mr. Ivo Josipovic, former president of the Republic of Croatia, a lawyer and a musician, 
Now, this is not your everyday combination of professions when talking about the highest position in the state. After the end of his mandate, in 2015, President Yosipovich returned to his teaching of music and law, including criminal international law, and is a familiar personality with international entities dealing with human rights, cultural, and scientific matters. Let me wish a very warm welcome to Mr. President Yosipovich. Then we have His Excellency Ambassador Todor Medeshkano, who is here in person, a career diplomat with an extensive experience in international law, and particularly in disarmament and multilateral affairs. Ambassador Medeshkano held the job of Minister of Foreign Affairs several times. He was a Minister of Defense, then head of the Foreign Intelligence Service, and advisor to the Prime Minister on Defense and Security. Minister, always a pleasure to welcome you Thank with you. us. His Excellency Ambassador Viktor Yakovich. Now, there are few American diplomats who may claim more direct knowledge of the Western Balkans than Ambassador Yakovich. Between 92 and 98, he was the first US ambassador to Bosnia and Herzegovina then moved on to the same position in Slovenia. His diplomatic career included assignments to Romania, Bulgaria, the Republic of Moldova, Russia, and other countries. A, s a fluent diplomat in several Balkans language, the ambassador is a strong advocate of using the appropriate language with the right person. A short while ago, he became a chairman of the EU-linked Business Advisory Consul Council for Southeast Europe and Eurasia. It's the first American who, who ever uh, held such a post. Ambassador, a very warm welcome to our conversation. His Excellency Ambassador Mihna Motok is a Romanian, Roma a Romanian diplomat, a career diplomat, who heads the think tank of the European Commission. It is quite significant that the current name of the think tank is IDEA, which stands for Inspire, Debate, Engage, and Accelerate Action. That is IDEA. Ambassador Motok was also a Minister of Defense once, while his diplomatic assignment included being Romania's permanent representative to UN in New York, to EU in Brussels, and our ambassador to the UK. A pleasure always to welcome you, Ambassador, at the NSE. And General Sir James Everard from the United Kingdom. A retired general, Sir James' last job was Deputy Supreme Allied Commander, Europe. Previously, he had been the operation commander of Altair, the EU operation in Bosnia-Herzegovina, for two years. His tremendous hands-on experience and comprehensive understanding of its non-military environment makes Sir James an outstanding voice in assessing ongoing developments as well as future challenges and opportunities. These are our four panelists. Regretfully, another welcome guest would have been uh, Deputy uh, Minister of Defense of the uh, Republic of North Macedonia. Um, however, uh, Mr. Maksuti uh, was compelled to decline his presence with us here because uh, of the efforts to shape up a new government in Macedonia. I think we may wish the team there good luck in this endeavor. So, these are the panelists, and uh, I guess that we should kick off the discussion, and in order to do that, I would kindly invite President Josipovic to share with us his readings of developments and perhaps even prospects in the Western Balkans. President, you have the virtual floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, all the best to all participants. Thank you for invitation. 
I have to apologize because about 2 to 10, I have to go. I have uh, other meeting, uh, but I'll try to participate uh, in constructive manner. So I think that now uh, more and more frequently uh, we are asking ourselves what is the future of uh, the Balkans. And uh, of course, it's not uh, without connection with what's going on to be uh, the future of the world. I have to remind you that the First World War started here uh, on, in Balkans. Uh, what will be the future? It will be the field for the chessboard uh, for fighting uh, big powers, or it will be space of prosperity and peace. Unfortunately, I'm not certain what is the answer. Uh, the obstacles uh, for good future are internal and external. Internal underdevelopment and weak economic, economic situation in almost all countries of Western Balkans. Uh, then low democratic standards. We are following what's going on in some countries and it's not always convincing. Uh, there is very high corruption and the rule of law problems uh, in many of countries. Uh, they have problems with minorities and human rights. And of course, uh, still serious consequences of war and conflicts in the 90s. And definitely one of the biggest obstacles is extreme nationalism uh, in most of countries. There are also external problems, different political issues with neighbors, border, even border disputes. Unfortunately, my country has border disputes as well, but not hot, uh, hot issues. But you never know when border issues can uh, arise as a serious uh, problem. Then, of course, there is always uh, uh, some kind of fear uh, of terrorism and migrations. Unfortunately, uh, this uh, special immigrations are not resolved properly. It's European problem, not only uh, Western Balkans problem. And of course, there are uh, many problems seeming from the solution of former Yugoslavia. And of course, the, the rule of big powers is not always, always certain and not always predictable. Now, yesterday, just yesterday, we witnessed uh, media, uh, very pronounced and very celebrated meeting between President Trump and the representatives of Serbia and Kosovo. But I have uh, to tell you that I'm very, very disappointed. I consider it as some uh, big nothing, big nothing. And I will, I will explain uh, what is the reason for my unsatisfaction with this meetings and its results. Uh, the, the, the uh, main risks in Balkan regions are internal relations in, in frames of Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, interference of neighbors and big powers as well. Unfortunately, the international community was not uh, decisive enough to help Bosnia and Herzegovina to resolve their internal problems. My thesis is that uh, there is no external power that can that can resolve the problem if uh, internal parties are not willing to do it. But definitely, especially United States and European Union can be some kind of moderators. Then there is a Middle East conflict and involvement of people from Balkans. Uh, there were significant number of people from some of countries fighting on Middle East uh, in Middle East wars. So now it's somehow uh, resolved, but unfortunately, people uh, that fight it uh, in the Middle East are now back in countries, and there always some kind of uh, security risk. Then there is a so important dispute between Serbia and Kosovo on independence. Then later, I will I will uh, refer myself to yesterday's uh, agreement. Uh, then internal relation in uh, in uh, North Macedonia uh, and relations between neighboring countries. I have to congratulate uh, Prime Minister Zaev and Greek former government uh, to reach uh, the, the 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 agreement about mutual relations, and it was really important step. I hope 
new governments in, in both countries are going to continue uh, with this good process. There are border disputes almost between all countries. And of course, corruption and organized crime uh, are on so high level that it imperils democratic structures in some of countries. There are, finally, there are three scenarios. One is from the end of the Second World War. It's Churchill-Stalin scenario about 50-50 uh, influence in former Yugoslavia. And what does it mean? Uh, that if that is idea to be followed, uh, that means continuation of internal and external disputes, negative economical development, involvement of big powers, chessboard will be moved to the Balkans, and violence is not excluded. The second is status quo scenario. That means permanent instability and permanent crisis. This yesterday, yesterday's agreement is somehow following this type of scenario. And the third, uh, the best scenario is that all countries fulfill obligations and gain uh, EU membership. That's very important because EU is primarily peace project, so much needed in this in this region. Uh, that will be, of course, the best the best solution. Uh, referring to uh, to uh, the yesterday's agreement, unfortunately, uh, I have to stress that I'm uh, disappointed. The main issue, the main issue, its mutual recognition is somehow put it aside. Uh, there are some economical uh, issues, mostly, in my opinion, motivated with economical interest of United States. Uh, and somehow it's uh, excuse for the other uh, topics not touched by agreement. Uh, then uh, some other important issues between Kosovo and Serbia are not touched at all. And this moratorium that's agreed, uh, Serbia is not going to push other countries to withdraw uh, uh, recognition of Kosovo. It's not so important because more or less Serbia exhausted all possible parties in that uh, task. And from the other side, Kosovo accepted moratorium of one year not to try to enter other uh, international organization. Uh, it's also not so big problem for them because uh, I think Kosovo reached um, most of organization access acceptable, accessible to them in this phases of their statehood. Um, uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, the, the biggest winner is Mr. Trump for internal purposes of the elections in the United States, uh, but substantially, uh, uh, it's just uh, giving new breath to Kosovo and Serbia for one year to try to negotiate without any substantial uh, move uh, in uh, in present situation. So uh, for me, uh, unfortunately, relations of Kosovo and Serbia face as very very important obstacle obstacle uh, of the permanent peace uh, and European future of uh, the region. Uh, there are also some strange uh, strange um, clauses uh, in this. Contact as as example, uh, uh, relations between Kosovo and Israel is put it inside. In spite that the, the Israel was not present, it was some kind of proxy of President Trump. Okay, it's very important for him, and probably he's going to to make it uh, working. But in for, uh, in fact, that is one of proof that this agreement was primarily meant as as uh, some kind of um, uh, good electional step for President Trump, not to substantial resolvement of, uh, of relations between Kosovo and Serbia. Of course, both sides, especially uh, Mr. Vucic, are now trying to explain that it's a big, big, big win for their countries. Uh, unfortunately, the result is zero, zero, more or less zero, zero. And I'm very unhappy because I think that Without relations between Kosovo and uh, Serbia, there will be not significant improvement of uh, relation in the region. Uh, I have to stress also that two European, Balkan European countries, 
primarily, I think, to Croatia and then uh, even to, to Slovenia. We are substantially interested in uh, relations in the Western Balkans because uh, we think, I think, especially that it's better to have a good neighborhood than the strongest military power for our security. We are small countries, and uh, we are very interested to have stable and peaceful uh, neighborhood. Uh, uh, so I think that our uh, most important neighbors are Bosnia and Herzegovina, Serbia, Kosovo, not immediate uh, neighbor, but substantially it's our neighborhood, uh, North, Macedo North Macedonia as well. So um, my policy was, I hope uh, it's now continued by by um, present government and present present pre president is to support European part of all uh, Western Balkans countries. It's in our best interest. It's important. It's in their best 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 interest. So uh, I would like to see uh, more engagement of European Union, especially more efficient engagement of European Union. And of course, uh, the most efficient and uh, uh, more more um, substantially uh, engaged involvement of United States, because especially in the instable time of crisis, not only caused by Corona, but other international circumstances, uh, it's uh, quite urgent to resolve uh, some of those problems in Western Balkans. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, uh, uh, Mr. President. Did I understand that you would uh, have to leave uh, uh, shortly? Uh, not shortly, about 2 to 15. All right. Okay. Um, because uh, there was a question I, I think that people would like to um, raise by the way of the White House meeting uh, and your comments. Okay. And that uh, was related to the next meeting, which is at the beginning of next week in Brussels, and what yeah. your expectations would be. Okay, would thank you. Would you care to answer now, right away? Okay, okay. Sure. Uh, unfortunately, I, was, I am always optimist, and uh, I'm very happy with any sign of goodwill uh, in any of uh, Balkan countries, not only Western Balkans, so-called Western Balkans, but uh, in our area, including my country as well. Uh, and I, I always welcome all meetings uh, of leaders from countries. So uh, this European meeting is very important. Uh, but after this meeting uh, in Washington, uh, it's hard to be very optimistic that something substantially will happen. Let's see. I would like to see, uh, finally, as soon as possible, a mutual recognition and um, uh, efforts to resolve really many problems uh, between Kosovo and Serbia, but not only Kosovo and Serbia. Even we are now a uh, European Union member, we have uh, open issues with uh, many countries, uh, with Bosnia and Herzegovina, with Serbia, uh, even with Slovenia, who is also an EU member. Uh, especially border issues, some other issues. So uh, now we are manage it, manage it on a very, a very um, uh, low level of tensions, and it's very good. But uh, somehow political elites escape from uh, from uh, trying to find final solutions, good solutions, honest solutions <clears throat> for all sides, because for many years, from political circles, from media, uh, too high expectations were uh, built for general public, and politicians are unfortunately afraid for their uh, um, rating in public, for always some kind of election taking place in, in uh, their countries. So uh, now I think we need uh, the leadership that's uh, not uh, burdened by, by elections or, or Clarity and uh, really honestly uh, uh, devoted to, to peace efforts in the region. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, uh, uh, Mr. President. Thank you. Minister Meneshkanu, we've heard from uh, President Yakubovic uh, that um, EU membership of the countries in the Western Balkans uh, looks like being the point, the solution or the best scenario. 
Is this an issue for the EU? Yeah, thank you very much, and I'm very grateful for this invitation. I want to start from uh, the point that uh, for the first time in our history, Romania assumed the presidency of the Council of European Union from the 1st of January uh, 2019 and 30th of June 2019. And one of our top priorities during our presidency was dedicated to the Western Balkans, among with other issues like the Eastern Partnership and others. What I wanted to say is that uh, Romania is not a Balkanic country, geographically, but it's obvious that our security and our economic development and others are interrelated with the Balkan countries. We finalized at the end of uh, our presidency the conclusions adopted by the General Affairs Council in June 2019. And on this occasion, we confirmed the approach and expressed the opinion that in the fall of 2019, Albania and Northern Macedonia should be invited to start negotiations for adherence, for joining the EU practically. Now, this policy also included the idea of having some instruments for uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina and uh, other countries like uh, Kosovo in the, in the region. I want to underline that during our presidency, we had the fantastic chance to have in Bucharest uh, very important personalities from the Western Balkans. There was a direct dialogue uh, at the level of the foreign ministers, it's happening every day, but also presidents, prime ministers, and other ministers for foreign affairs. Now, the main results for our presidency were um, approving the facility for the refugees in Turkey, financial contribution, relaunching after uh, an important part of years, the Association Council with Turkey, presiding the Association Council with Montenegro, organizing the Intergovernmental Conference for the Adherence of Serbia, EU and USA um, cooperation in the Western Balkans, consultations EU-Russia on the dossiers for enlargement, visits in Albania and North, Ma North Macedonia on the topic of starting the negotiations for enlargement. I would like to raise a point, and please be kind to take it into account. One of the special events was organized and dedicated by the Romanian presidency in Bucharest, a meeting of the young generations from the Western Balkans, with the participation of the European Commission and regional organization. It is obvious that it was a very clear signal about the fact that we have to look in the future, not into the history, very difficult history of the Balkan countries. Um, geographically, politically, and socially, from the security point of view as well, for me, the Western Balkans are part and parcel of Europe. All the states from, uh, from the region have an institutionalized relationship with European unions, and they, they will continue. Um, the foreign minister of Germany declared publicly uh, a few uh, weeks ago that the Western Balkans is an integral part of Europe. And the large majority of states of the European Union, including Romania, supported the beginning of starting the negotiations of adherence for Albania and Northern Macedonia. But there was no consensus on it. Even if we had conclusions uh, last year, it's obvious there was no consensus, and the main opponent, we have to call it by name. It was France, or President Macron. It depends on your desire, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Kifu. Yeah. Uh, I, I wanted to, uh, to underline that we, want, we, we understand very well the, the fact that um, there is a certain fatigue 
concerning the policy of extension of the European Union. And there are certain elements which deserve to be uh, analyzed. The first element is differences inside the European Union about the future of, uh, of this organization. If, even if we are speaking about solidarity and cohesion, in practice, some of the members are thinking about the idea of nucleus and periphery or the European Union with different speeds. In my opinion, as long as we envisage such developments and discussions, it is obvious that the enlargement is practically blocked. The second element is represented by the departure of the United Kingdom from the European Union. This departure created a big hole, which is difficult to be overcome. It is not only the effect of the financial contribution, but also a lack of balancing point of view inside the European Union. To this, I am adding the negative impact in the field of security and defense for the European Union. Now, a third element is the impact of the pandemic crisis and its effects of the European Union. The European Union presented uh, an important plan, sev 750 billion. I don't want to enter into it, but what I can say is that the budget of the European Union will be cut at least into two chapters which are extremely important for Romania. One of them being the structural, uh, uh, being the structural funds, the cohesion funds, which were uh, diminished, and uh, also the rural development and uh, agricultural policy, less than one billion. More than that, all these funds are accompanied, obligatory, by structural reforms. For me, when you speak about structural reforms, reforms, it means austerity. For a lot of members of the European Union, including Romania. It is obvious that under these circumstances, some of the important countries of the European Union will be extremely reluctant to support the enlargement, as they already did it. These countries are not taking into account a lot of advantages, but it is happening. And in this context, I would like to add one issue. In the context of the discussions about the Western Balkans at the level of the European Union, we have to take also into account the presence and the importance of countries like Russia, China, Turkey, and the states of the Gulf, and Iran, which Practically, in practice, they are contesting the pro-Occidental orientation of the region by using very different instruments, economic, political, social, cultural, ethnic, religious, and military. Under these realities, we see a competition between European and NATO and United States on one side and Russia, China, Gulf states, and Iran on the other side. Russia has an active economic diplomacy and a political and military activity, and their main objective is practically to delay the uh, integration of the Balkans in the Euro-Atlantic uh, space. China is more subtle, but it's very ambitious. They have a significant, uh, they are a significant player. Uh, they want to enter in Europe through a region which is considered uh, weak. We have, they have very important instruments, belts, Belt and Roads Initiative, an investment through 17 plus one initiative, and other instruments. United States are supporting the extension of NATO in the competition with Russia and China. Turkey is historically present in the region from the times of the Ottoman Empire and represent an important commercial and investment partner for the regions. Gulf countries, especially uh, the Emirates, are important investors and Iran is developing the relations with the region. From my point of view in this, where we are now about the Balkans, 
In the present situation, I think that the European Union is not look at the extension as a priority. We have clearly uh, mentioned that uh, every day there are delays in adopting the decision. And under these circumstances, from my point of view, the best solution for the time being is to offer for the Western Balkan countries their association to a single market of the European Union. And it is working for countries very well, like Norway, Islands, and Liechtenstein. It is our duty and interest to do our best in order to finalize the European Union in its geography. Romania will continue to strongly support the enlargement of the European Union for the Western Balkans, including such intermediate measures in the interest of their citizens and of the European citizens as a whole. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Minister, for uh, this uh, comprehensive image. And I would like now to turn to Ambassador Yakovic. Ambassador, one of the buzzwords today is interaction. And this is often replaced by interdependence and interinfluence sometimes. Um, you have just uh, heard, uh, Ambassador, that uh, uh, the Minister Meleshkanu uh, presented us some footprints of various players <coughs> from outside the area. How do you, whether uh, you have anything to add to this image of the um, uh, influence that other players have on the Western Balkans? Thank you very much. Uh, I hope you can hear me and see me properly. I'm uh, communicating with you from far away Florida in the United States. I want to thank the New Strategy Center, first of all, for this opportunity. I am highly impressed by the caliber of the uh, panelists and the other attendees and participants in the conference. I'm deeply honored that I'm among them. And uh, especially, uh, I would have to say, Minister Melescanu, I have always regarded him as a institution in Romanian modern development and Romanian modern diplomacy. An honor to be here with him on the same panel. My preference would be to be in Romania with you, but uh, obviously many of us have to do this by uh, remotely because of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, when I look at one of the titles of this panel, <clears throat> uh, Great Power Competition, I personally can count uh, five power centers in general, there are some others as well, five main power centers that I would look at, and they are the United States, Europe, Russia, China, and then uh, some of the Middle Eastern states that have a focus primarily, of course, understandably, on the Muslim populations of the region, and this means primarily uh, Bosnia, Kosovo, and Albania. Uh, but I would like to focus on the four that I mentioned earlier, United States, Europe, China, and Russia. The situation in the Balkans is clear to all of us. We have a, a lack of forward movement uh, on enlargement uh, of the EU, as Minister Melisconu eloquently pointed out. Uh, many reasons for this, many good reasons and understandable reasons for it. Uh, President Macron, uh, in many interviews and in many uh, uh, public remarks has, I think, eloquently <clears throat> outlined what some of the problems are in terms of cohesion of the European Union itself and getting a handle on managing what has been achieved by the EU enlargement so far, which is considerable. Um, and uh, this uh, growing nationalism and protectionism uh, fed also by the uh, COVID crisis, the economic crisis, the migration crisis, is also putting a break on certain countries' ability to look with favor upon continued enlargement. 
uh, a second uh, trend or a second uh, part of the situation I see at the present is, is the United States. And uh, when we talk about the United States, we have to be direct. Uh, I'm an American. I'm uh, broadcasting to you or talking to you from the United States. Uh, we have an administration in power at the moment that is looking internally at American domestic requirements and has not put uh, a great emphasis on international affairs and even on in international alliances. This is prompting in many European states to look at how they can become more self-reliant, uh, but within a continuing context, I believe, of a traditionally strong partnership between the United States and Europe. Um, there may be people who are looking at the elections coming up and saying, well, if we have a new presidency, a new administration in the United States, there will be a correction of sorts, if I can use that word. I would only caution that uh, President Trump uh, was not the only leader of this approach in foreign affairs, but rather he gave voice to strong sentiments among uh, many parts of the American people uh, that are concerned about what they consider to be overextension in international affairs and a need to uh, be more introspective about our domestic requirements. Um, if we look at uh, the EU not being able to enlarge at this moment, and if we look at American, um, I would say, sporadic engagement from time to time, as President Josipovic pointed out, part of that is the recent agreement between Kosovo and Serbia. Um, then we look at a third part of the situation, which I see as more space, a moving into that space that is left by Russia and by China. Uh, Russia's approach is multi-pronged. Sometimes they will look at things uh, commercially, economically, uh, being able to uh, acquire entities in countries like Slovenia or Bulgaria. But they also have, they can also be much more aggressive as we see by the fact that they are the primary uh, defense provider, uh, provider of defense equipment to Serbia and uh, are also uh, involved in the alleged uh, attempt to assassinate the president of Montenegro. More insidiously, Russia is involved in a public information effort and social media effort that I consider to be uh, rather dangerous because they are portraying very often a decadent West, a West that is no longer interested in the Western Balkans, a West that has uh, vacated the area, that is any, in any case uh, decadent, and uh, they portray themselves as more vigorous, more engaged, more tradition bound, and more sharing of the values and the sentiments of the grassroots populations of the uh, uh, peoples of the Balkans and the peoples of Eastern Europe. This has certain residents, resonance, among certain parts of the population, particularly when we deal with Orthodox countries and Slavic countries. Here, I would like to say a few words about the recent situation in Montenegro, because after elections there, one can easily see that this provides a possible opportunity for Russia. Uh, I would like to say that the situation is still unfolding, so it's difficult to comment on it in its uh, fresh moments. Uh, but for all of his faults, uh, President Zhukanovich can be credited with leading his country from being an appendage of the Milosevic Empire into being a full member of NATO, a successful candidate for the EU, and giving his people a European perspective. Uh, I fully expect that the Montenegrin people now will, uh, as a sovereign state, uh, hopefully look at this Euro-Atlantic perspective as having primacy in their country. China also moving into this vacuum, moving into this space uh, with this, uh, as uh, Minister Meliscano pointed out, the Belt and Road Initiative, commercially based, infrastructure based, but also lately branching out into other areas. Defense, for example, uh, they are providing, as far as I know from uh, press reports, they're providing something called the FK-3 anti-aircraft system to Serbia the first time that this aircraft system, anti-aircraft system has been provided 
outside of China, to my knowledge. So what do we do in the Balkans? Well, there are many cliches uh, afoot, and uh, when something is a cliche, it usually has a foundation in truth, making it a cliche. Uh, U.S. engagement is a given. We must have more U.S. engagement. We must have more EU, European engagement. But it must be based on a thoroughly thought out, comprehensive, visionary strategy for the entire region, uh, not the sporadic engagement that we have in the past seen, Dayton in Bosnia, the latest agreement on Kosovo and Serbia in Washington, but rather something that is thoroughly thought out for the entire region in a comprehensive way. And not in isolation, the United States and Europe from each other, not in competition with each other, but in close coordination with each other. Uh, another cliche is that the peoples and the governments of the region must be stay on track with reform, with democratization, with modernization. The people of the region need not be, they have the power, the people, the electorate, the, the, the grassroots populations, they have the power. They need not be forever beholden to nationalist governments that are more interested sometimes in fostering false regional rivalries than strong cross-border cooperation. Well, these are generalizations, but let's look at some specific possibilities. Um, NATO enlargement is possible more easily than EU enlargement for a lot of different reasons that we all know. Therefore, maybe we should have a NATO that is looking very strongly, strategically, at uh, stronger enlargement. Uh, and I'm looking not only at the Balkans, the, the work that needs to continue to be done on NATO enlargement in the Balkans, Bosnia and Herzegovina significantly, uh, but also further afield, Georgia, Ukraine. Um, we can also foster greater cooperation, I think, between the United States, the European states, and the Balkan states in intelligence, uh, cyberspace, and countering false narratives that come from hostile sources, whether that be Russia, China, or others. Um, thirdly, I would call for something called, that I call institutional pairing. Uh, I have in mind here the pairing of a, let's say a government ministry or agency in one of the Western Balkan states with a like-minded institution or a similar institution in Western Europe or the United States. I know that these relationships already exist and everybody will say, well, we're already doing that. But I have in mind something that is very deep and very thorough, the exchange of people, uh, mutual consultation on legislation, sharing of documentation, sharing of experience in a very deep manner. Uh, my fourth point in terms of specifics would be Romania, the role that Romania can play. And here I see Romania playing a seminal role in three ways. First, along a north-south axis together with Poland, very important that the two strong pillars in the eastern flank of NATO and the European Union uh, have very strong cooperation between them, Poland and Romania. Uh, secondly, in relations on the Black Sea, and here the uh, new strategy center has had very many events uh, focused on the Black Sea and the importance of that area, the importance of uh, making sure that it is uh, an area of international cooperation stability and security and not continued Russian aggression. And thirdly, Moldova, because you have a very special opportunity relationship with Moldova. Uh, I think, in fact, I would uh, say very bluntly that the OSCE mission in Chisinau needs to be restructured. It needs to disband even and restructure itself with a stronger role for Romania. Uh, this has been a mistake from the beginning with OSCE in uh, Chisinau. Uh, there can be no lasting international agreement on Moldova um, without a very strong role by Romania. And finally, I would like to make one final proposal, and people who know me personally and professionally uh, may be a bit surprised that I say this, but we in the Euro-Atlantic community must not give up on Russia. And when I say must not give up on Russia, I am not talking about the dictatorship of Putin, the kleptocracy of the oligarchs, 
and the militarism of the hegemonists. I'm talking about the Russian people. There must be some way that we can foster and enhance a dialogue with professional associations, universities, youth groups, in order to have a relationship with the Russian people. The future of the continent and the future of Euro-Atlantic relations, it seems to me, will depend very heavily upon that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you indeed, uh, Ambassador Yakovic, for your uh, very illuminating, I would say, uh, introduction. And now we move over to Brussels uh, to Ambassador Motok. I, I just mentioned that uh, the uh, acronym of his uh, uh, organization is IDEA, so uh, uh, let me surrender to the strong temptation and ask Ambassador Motok whether he has any ideas about how the uh, Western Balkans figure in the Commission's plans and in the plans of other EU institutions. Ambassador, to you. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador. It's uh, uh, a great pleasure for me to see long-standing uh, uh, friends that I admire and to, to be part of this prestigious uh, panel. Um, before uh, getting into, into the evocation of, uh, of ideas, I have to confess that I have a very trivial uh, uh, problem. I'm experiencing a, um, a, a, an impossibility to, to charge my, my laptop. I don't know why, because it's very new. I hope to last until the, the end of the panel, at least. So uh, bear with me if I uh, if I'll uh, try to be uh, briefer than uh, than usual. But first, uh, the traditional disclaimer on uh, on my side: uh, the views I'll be expressing, of course, are mine uh, alone, and uh, they do not necessarily uh, reflect the official positions of the European Commission. Although you can count on me not to stray very far uh, from uh, those. Uh, with that off my chest, uh, I'd like to wholeheartedly congratulate you for convening this virtual event. I, be I believe, like previous speakers, that um, while the Black Sea and the Western Balkans are uh, obviously areas of elevated uh, geopolitical profile and one of the terms of choice for uh, great power competition and uh, and influence uh, and, and that they have um, uh, experienced even during the pandemics uh, a, a significant deal of, of turbulence and I'm sure once uh, this will subside we will uh, be seeing a lot more of geopolitical activity and change in this area. So in spite of all this relevance uh, we have to, to agree that uh, these regions are still getting relatively little attention and therefore require uh, what I would uh, call permanent advocacy. I'll, I'll limit myself to giving you um, uh, an overview of the um, present uh, state of play of the uh, enlargement process. Uh, of course, against uh, the backdrop of um, uh, COVID impacted the European Union itself. So uh, recently I was, um, uh, I was, um, uh, listening to, to a conversation that was uh, based on the question what kind of power the European Union is likely to be in 2050, for instance, and the, the choices were uh, a great power, a small power, a no power, or, uh, or um, a, a hybrid power. So uh, I, the, the consensus was that, uh, that by then, and in any case on the mid middle run, the EU will uh, remain an important global, uh, global actor. Now that might uh, not sound uh, that attractive as, uh, as the previous options, but I think it's, it's a, an accurate description of, of the likely uh, power projection of the European Union in the future. It will certainly have a leading role across a series of, uh, of uh, prominent topics on the international agenda, such as climate change, global trade, uh, digital transformation, and uh, uh, certainly multilateralism. However, uh, it is um, commonly accepted also that global relevance uh, cannot be conceived or is hard, hard to be conceived without sufficient influence in one's uh, own backyard. And, uh, and I'm turning now uh, properly to the Western Balkans, uh, uh, pointing out at first that uh, all of the uh, countries region right now are, are uh, completely neighbored by uh, EU member states. And uh, as, um, if I'm not mistaken, it was Chris Patton a few years ago who, who said that the region is the missing piece of uh, the uh, jigsaw Europe. 
Uh, now, so far, I think we can all concur that the enlargement process uh, has been one of the most successful EU policies. And uh, while I agree it has um, uh, somehow slowed down uh, over the recent years, I guess it is still very uh, noteworthy to to see that uh, that a landmark decision, which was um, which was the um, um, uh, start of the accession talks with Albania and North Macedonia, has been taken not before but during the pandemic. And I'm also glad to note that for a geopolitical commission, uh, engaging with the Western Balkans uh, is uh, and remains a top priority. And that's demonstrated by a series of, uh, of very concrete steps taken already this year. Aside from that decision to start accession talks, uh, we, have, uh, we have this uh, early adoption of a revised enlargement methodology to make accession more uh, credible, more predictable, more dynamic, and uh, guided by a stronger political steer. We have uh, this 3.3 uh, uh, billion um, aid package that's, uh, that's put together by the European Commission and the uh, European Investment Bank, and it's meant uh, to uh, support the region hit by the pandemic. And the last but not least, the Zagreb uh, Summit, which, uh, which was a very clear reaffirmation of uh, the European perspective for the region, along with uh, solidarity and enhanced EU engagement with it. I can say one thing will uh, remain unchanged. Uh, the uh, uh, enlargement will continue to be merit-based, and uh, and uh, I cannot stress enough the importance of advancing reforms on uh, items such as rule of law, vital items such as rule of law, fundamental freedoms, fight against uh, corruption and organized crime. And this is, as I think uh, uh, a previous speaker uh, also indicated, uh, this is exactly what people in the region want. Uh, they, they came to somehow consider corruption as uh, the new communism, and uh, some 71% of them believe that uh, their governments are not doing a good job fighting uh, corruption successfully. So, of course, the faster the progress on reforms, the faster the advancement in uh, negotiations. And uh, let me give you some uh, statistics from the latest uh, 2020 uh, Balkan barometer, which uh, I, I selected two, uh, two stats that, uh, that are somehow opposite. On the positive side, 59% of respondents consider that EU membership is, uh, would be a good thing, which is up 10% compared to last year. Another fi finding is, however, a little bit more, more worrying uh, in the sense that 26% of them uh, think that this will never happen. And I, I, I can only hope that that should change in the light of the decision to open negotiations with Albania and North uh, Macedonia. Uh, now, what's the next? Uh, the next important milestone is uh, the um, uh, presentation of the uh, fall annual package by the Commission. Uh, which is uh, uh, not only expected to reflect uh, progress on, on reforms, but uh, will come along with, um, with a very robust uh, economic and investment plan for the Western Balkans, which is aiming both at recovery, at economic recovery, and also uh, 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 at uh, catching up with a particular focus on, uh, uh, on uh, modern uh, parameters such as connectivity, green transition, and uh, digital uh, transformation. Let me say a final word on, uh, on something that's been important um, all along, uh, that's regional cooperation. Uh, it will be important now for, uh, for um, fostering economic recovery. Uh, it was, uh, it was uh, proven uh, viable during the pandemic when, uh, you remember, the um, region was able to address uh, common challenges uh, swiftly and effectively. Let's uh, recall the uh, green lanes for trade flows, for instance, which were, were agreed upon quite uh, early. Now, what uh, in, in the future, I guess uh, the most important thing will be uh, jointly developing a vision, a vision for the regional economic uh, area. Uh, Minister Meleshkan will allude to, to, to that. Uh, uh, I would, uh, I would uh, just uh, give the uh, uh, inner region aspect of, uh, of uh, this possibility, namely building um, a regional economic area, which will increase its uh, attractiveness and competitiveness. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ambassador. And uh, uh, let us uh, move on now to Sir James. You know, uh, Sir James, whenever we think about the history of the area, we may find the best um, sentences that describes it, and that sentence would be, it's complicated. What 
can we say about the future of the area? Do you think this, this image may change and become less complicated? Uh, thank you. Buenosia, salute. Um, silence is, is not always golden. Uh, and we do not talk about the West Balkans uh, enough. This is an old problem. And I congratulate the new strategy center for including uh, the Western Balkans as a subject today. It's clever, it's also uh, important uh, and relevant because of course, as we've heard, it is a uh, logical extension of the Black uh, Sea uh, region. Um, I spent about two years of my life deployed somewhere in the Western Balkans. As you kindly said, I was also the operation commander uh, for the EU for Operation Althea for, for two years. And as the UK Commander Field Army and DSAC, uh, I spent some time in Albania, Bosnia Herzegovina, North Macedonia, um, uh, Montenegro, where I think we're all watching uh, events unfold given the recent uh, election, which has exposed deep societal. Uh, divisions uh, and the power again of Serb uh, uh, nationalism uh, in Montenegro, uh, Serbia, and of course uh, Kosovo. And they're all very uh, different, uh, and it is difficult to address these nations uh, of the Western Balkans as a single entity. As we know, you know three countries are now NATO members uh, and in different stages of uh, EU integration. But it should be a concern that 30 years after the disintegration uh, of uh, Yugoslavia, uh, these countries in the Western Balkans outside the EU are finding it uh, near impossible to make progress on their European uh, path. Uh, as we know, there are plenty of funds available uh, to help them to uh, adjust uh, and reform, uh, but they face real difficulties in delivering the reforms that allow them to make uh, progress. Uh, and many of these challenges are not new. Uh, in 1937, Rebecca West traveled to the Balkans with the objective of writing a book, uh, quote, to show the past side by side with the present it created. And of course, she found a history written in flesh and blood. And her book, Black Lamb and Grey Falcon, a journey through Yugoslavia that was published in 1941. In that book, we can see uh, then, as we can see now, the fragile nature of our uh, achievements when pitted against our capacity for inaction and uh, destruction. Uh, and this in a region, of course, beset by old problems and now compounded by the new challenges uh, in this era of great uh, power competition, playing out in my mind most visibly in the Western Balkans and indeed in the Black uh, Sea uh, region. Importantly, this is not simply a, a fight between democracy and autocracy. Uh, for example, uh, the EU and the US have recently initiated fresh talks with Serbia and Kosovo, uh, as we've heard. But these uh, appear to me uh, not to be coordinated and even competitive. And this weakens the efforts of both sides. You know, we need to be better. The one thing the Western Balkans does not need is US uh, EU discord uh, at the moment. I think the good news is that security in the Western Balkans is not a problem uh, and the risk of conflict remains very low. You know, the buzz phrase is fragile uh, but stable, uh, when I think in fact that's an oxymoron. However, with the hollowing out of these societies and the interference of third actors, the situation could change. Indeed, I think our biggest concern should be the point in time that may come when the attraction of the West, both the Europe and the US, uh, would be overtaken by the lure of an alternative path because of the deep-rooted uh, divisions in the societies, because of the fatigue of the populations, because of the low prospects of progress towards a better future, given, I think, stagnated reform, rampant criminality, strikingly high youth unemployment, extravagant political corruption, and of course, in the case of Bosnia-Herzegovina, the Dayton Agreement, which I think ended the war, but has made political progress almost impossible, and now needs to be further changed to create something that is more workable 
uh, for the future uh, of uh, the country. Uh, I see the uh, influence of the Gulf states in the Western Balkans, both positive and uh, negative. I think uh, more worryingly, Moscow and Beijing uh, sensing uh, an opening have become more determined in their efforts to gain more influence and leverage uh, in uh, the region. Uh, I think the 2019 Atlantic Council report on competition in Southeast Europe suggested that China's approach is more subtle. I think uh, that was said before. But I think its ambitions are more significant. Quote, to enter Europe through a region it views as the continent's soft underbelly in order to prevent Europe from siding with the United States in any emerging global confrontation. Uh, Russia, or Russia's focus, is on disrupting and encouraging resistance uh, to the process of NATO and EU integration, and to, I think, tarnish the image of Western-style uh, democracy uh, in Southeast uh, Europe. And the terms of NATO certainly attack our central gravity, unity, uh, solidarity, and uh, cohesion. And as we've heard, I think Montenegro you know, a NATO member is perhaps the current battleground. Uh, and uh, I've no doubt that Russia is offering support uh, to the uh, future of Montenegro uh, coalition. Uh, I think with Russia as well, there's also a clear willingness and an ability to prolong and aggravate uh, political instability. You know, we see this in Bosnia, uh, Herzegovina, through the lever they have through Republika uh, Serbska. Uh, of course, the integration process is designed to counter corruption, bolster rule of law, and build national uh, capabilities. But Russia has found leverage in exploiting uh, corruption and uh, weak uh, institution, using all the levers uh, that it has. Uh, you know, corruption, uh, weak institutions, energy, uh, information operations, disinformation, and of course, uh, the Orthodox uh, Church. Um, I also think more recently uh, there was an attempt by Russia and China to portray themselves as saviors by delivering medical equipment and support in the early stages of the COVID-19 uh, crisis. I found it interesting that this had a immediately positive effect uh, from the public in the region, but over time this effect appears to be fading. Why? Because the same people realise that uh, protection against COVID means long-term uh, measures, uh, which they can ill afford to pay for, and it's the EU uh, that provide uh, the money. Uh, and uh, NATO, well, NATO is very active in the region, uh, consolidating its position as a provider of security and a facilitator of uh, interstate uh, corruption, uh, corruption, cooperation in a way that is transparent, uh, in a way that I think which is a uh, force for good, and in a way that can counter mistruth and uh, disinformation. I think the future, you asked about the future, I think it will depend on where this competition uh, takes us. Given the unfinished business in the region is primarily about EU integration, and of course the struggle between those who wish to accelerate or slow uh, this uh, process. I think my biggest concern is the population, uh, particularly the young, uh, are losing uh, hope. This has, of course, two consequences, a constant brain drain on one and uh, removing talent that weakens these countries uh, further. And secondly, uh, as we know, creating the conditions for uh, malign actors to just increase this downward spiral, leading to uh, disappointment, to decay, to decline, and perhaps, if we're not careful, uh, destruction. Uh, my final point, and I think it's been said a number of times, I sense uh, a Western political fatigue when it comes to the Western uh, Balkans. But I strongly believe that this is not a time to slow our efforts. You know, we need more from the EU, we need more from the US, despite the problems surrounding EU integration and NATO. Uh, integration. Uh, you know, the people need a quicker path to something better, uh, even accepting that the EU cannot uh, and will not give ground on their rightly high 
uh, standard. And likewise, NATO, you know, can do more as the Alliance works to deliver uh, the concept for the deterrence and defense of the Euro-Atlantic uh, area, it can better support efforts to contest in order to protect uh, the progress that we have made uh, so far in the Western Balkans. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sir James. Um, dear friends, both here uh, in, in Bucharest and online, um, Unfortunately, our time is up. We have some two minutes left, but I think that we can push it a little bit with your um, agreement. And uh, where if you have any questions that you'd like to raise to our panelists, or some of them at least, that are still with us, please do. Professor uh, Dungacu from the Romanian Academy, you have a microphone on your right hand hand. Thank you, Dan uh, Dungacu, New Strategy Center, for Ambassador Jakovic. A question, because um, you mentioned the Montenegro elections, and I think that elections, recent elections, and very interesting elections, at least for one reason for me. One dimension became very significant, very relevant politically, and it's this religious dimension. And it is something which is there, uh, is not necessarily new, but apparent, apparently very ignored by us. And uh, my, my feeling is that what is going on in the Western Balkans, it's a sort of a geopolitics of orthodoxy uh, uh, with all these elements, autocephaly, national churches, um, religious nationalism, and so on and so forth. And there are some, some commentators who would argue that the passivity of Russia could be explained uh, in, in Turkey, I mean, with this re-Islamization of the Hagia Sophia, it was basically a Russian response to the Patriarch of Constantinople uh, and to the Americans for their recognition of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, autocephaly in Ukraine. So my point is that uh, geopolitics of orthodoxy is significant and could become more and more, more significant in the Western Balkans. We have Montenegro, we could have Macedonia. It's also a very, very complicated religious situation there. Uh, it's obvious it's there in Ukraine, could be, uh, it's, it's also relevant in the Republic of Moldova where we have two churches, one Romanian, one, one Russian. So, so this dimension, religious dimension in the Balkans has been completely ignored, but I think there is a huge potential there for geopolitics, uh, politics, as it has, has been proved recently in, in Montenegro. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, Ambassador, would you like to com comment on that? Uh, only very briefly, in the interest of time that we apparently no longer have, uh, my greatest respect to Don uh, uh, Dugaccio and uh, his many, many reports and studies that I've, uh, are sort of the Bible, I think, for many of us as we read what he writes about the region. And uh, the comment about the religious aspect, if I understood it correctly, um, is, is very real. Uh, and something that hasn't been given uh, the proper attention. Uh, the situation in Montenegro was uh, surprising uh, in many ways because uh, not to get into uh, an explanation of it, uh, especially not from uh, my side, but uh, it seems that the church had a tremendous role in uh, the Serbian Orthodox Church, had a, a tremendous role in what happened politically in Montenegro. This was uh, not uh, expected by many observers, I think uh, not expected by the incumbent uh, government. And um, uh, it, where this goes in the future will be something that we need to uh, look at very carefully. There will be outside actors taking advantage of that, uh, and they are obvious, I think, in this case. Uh, but I think also I look at the um, a coalition as it is emerging. And again, events are so fresh, it's very difficult to comment on what's going to happen. But I think they have, at least in initial comments after the election, uh, they have a more sober viewpoint about what they're going to do in the future. If before the elections they said, we're going to have a referendum on NATO and we're going to do this and that, I think uh, many elements of that coalition are saying something different today. You know, when you get into power, 
and you have responsibilities, you sometimes act a little differently. We may be seeing that. Also, I think that there has been enough of Montenegrin statehood and uh, identification of a Montenegrin state and um, uh, an independent sovereign entity um, that even people living there who are uh, the Serbian nationality and the, the percentage varies because the sense of nationality in the Balkans is sometimes very nebulous and sometimes uh, can vary with, uh, with times. Uh, but many of these people live in Montenegro. They do live in Montenegro. I have confidence that in the end, the Montenegrin people, however difficult it will be for them to find their way in this new situation, will look upon the Euro-Atlantic path as the one that they prefer. And just one last quick comment. The Djukanovic government that was in power for such a long time, many of these people are under the age of 30. Uh, they only know one government in their lifetimes. So we must, I think, give them a wide berth to find their way. It's going to be difficult for them. And we must, of course, help them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Uh, any other comments or questions we have here? I'm afraid not. Uh, so um, I would like to definitely thank very much the panelists. Minister, I take advantage of you being Mr. just nice to me. And uh, uh, I started with the minister because he's just next to me, and definitely to all other panelists that were far in uh, physical terms, but definitely together with us uh, today. I am not going to uh, draw any conclusions. It will be preposterous on my behalf. Um, however, I couldn't help noticing something. Look at the title of the panel. Look again. And replace Western Balkans with what? With Europe. And you won't be very much mistaken. And um, one thing at least that perhaps is quite important, we've heard several panelists voicing it in one way or another, is that this side has to do a lot of work to reform, to update, to change, to modernize, and so on and so forth. And this side has to do a lot of work to reform, to change, to update, to upgrade. So it means that there is a lot of work to do on all sides. Uh, and this is a very strong message, I think, that one of the strong messages that our panel um, has uh, broadcast. And uh, I guess that uh, the new strategy center is uh, more than ready to be a part of this effort. Thank you very much for your participation, for your patience, and for your understanding of the special conditions that we have nowadays. Thank you and have a wonderful afternoon. Don't forget we have two other at least as exciting panels following uh, immediately in uh, this uh, wonderful environment. Thank you.